Good morning guys, the Comics Kid 2099 here. And over the last three weeks, I have been torturing myself by reading and reviewing X-Men The End, written by Chris Claremont and drawn by Sean Chen. And I ended the year 2014 reviewing that series, and so I thought, what better way to start off the year 2015 than by reading and reviewing the sequel to X-Men The End, Gen X. This series, according to the back of this book, basically says, what if the X-Men existed in real time and aged like real people? And so this follows the next generation of X-Men students at the Xavier's Mansion. And I'm going to go ahead and say, if you've never read X-Men The End, but you're maybe interested in this, you can go ahead and read this. This it is it distances itself enough from X-Men the end that if you haven't read that you're not going to be super confused it does reference a few things that happened in that miniseries but not to the point where you're gonna be pulling your hair out wondering what's going on here I don't understand any of this at least in terms of what happened in X-Men the end and what happened here also speaking of X-Men the end I did not like X-Men The End. You can go back and watch all three of my videos on that mega series. I really hated X-Men The End. It was not very good. Is this any better than X-Men The End? I'm going to say yes it is, but that doesn't say a whole lot because X-Men The End was, in my humble opinion, the worst X-Men related thing that Chris Claremont has ever written. So basically everything and anything in the world would be better than X-Men The End. This is a lot better though. For one thing, X-Men The End tried to focus on like 30 different X-Men characters and it tried to tie up and end everything related to the X-Men in the span of 18 issues, which would be a Herculean task for anybody and even a really good writer or a writer who is at least capable of being really good like Chris Claremont would have trouble doing something like that. This is not that. This is a five issue miniseries that focuses on five mutant teenagers who go to the Xavier Institute. In a way, it kind of takes things back to basics. It's not trying to end the Marvel Universe. It's not trying to do the concluding story to every X-Men storyline and every X-Men character who ever existed. It's just a story about five mutants who are going to the Xavier School and then stuff is happening and we're following them on their adventures. And I think that's a good thing. The old adage that less is more, it totally holds true here. Claremont is not trying to do everything. He's not trying to overexert the story. He's not trying to include way too much stuff here, and therefore I think the story is stronger because of that. Having said that, this story is not perfect. It's got a lot of problems. The big problem is that the big plot here, I don't understand it, and I'm not even sure if Chris Claremont understood it. Basically, you have these five teenage characters here, and one of them, no name, this little teenage girl right here, uh, apparently nobody at the school knows anything about her, including her four best friends. And she is either kidnapped or is on the run, and we find out that the bad guys in this story are actually five versions of the five original X-Men from an alternate reality, and they are dark X-Men, if you will. And I'm sure that these characters appeared in something like Claremont's 2000s Excalibur series or his new Exile series or something like that. I never read any of that stuff, so I don't know if these characters appeared in those stories or not. But they want something from this character of no name, and then basically the plot is that her other four friends are going to rescue her so that she doesn't have to face these guys alone. That's basically the plot. The problem is we don't know what these five dark X-Men want from no name, and we never find that out in this miniseries. And there is a sequel to this miniseries called Gen X United, but I do not like the idea of nothing is explained in this five issue miniseries and so you have to go and buy the sequel miniseries to find out what's going on. I don't like that. I think that this story should stand on its own and then if it's good, if it's worthy, it can have its own sequel, but if it's not good, if it doesn't stand on its own, you shouldn't have to go and buy the sequel to find out what the heck was going on in the first story. And that's kind of what's going on here. At the end of the day, I don't really understand what any of these characters were fighting for other than these four main characters who are going to rescue their best friend I know what they're fighting for they are fighting to rescue their best friend But I don't understand why they are fighting this fight with these other people. What do these other people want? I don't really understand also some of these characters are really not very likable at all for example I can tell that if Chris Claremont had gone on with this cast of characters for another 30 or 40 issues, Becca Monroe, that's this girl right here, she very easily would have turned into his new Kitty Pride. You can kind of tell that he has a soft spot for this character. 
and I don't really understand why, because the very first issue tries to paint her as being this wallflower who won't even help her friends when they get into a fight, and then throughout the other four issues, suddenly she's this commanding, no-nonsense, takes charge of the situation character, and I had kind of, I, I had trouble reading this character. I don't really understand what kind of character she's supposed to be. Is she the wallflower who doesn't want to get involved in X-Men business and doesn't want to get into a fight? Or is she the takes charge of the situation character like her mother or grandmother? It doesn't really explain how she's related to Storm, but I'm assuming since her name is Becky Monroe that she is somehow related to Storm. It doesn't really come clear who this character is. A lot of the other characters in this book are treated a lot better. I would say the only other characters who are treated about as badly as Becky Monroe would be No Name, who is basically just a plot device in this story, and also this other guy. I don't even know his name. Uh, we don't really know anything about him. Throughout the story, it's hinting that he is like this super genius, and it keeps mentioning that he is a third generation superhero. And it is strongly hinted that he is the son of Franklin Richards. It never actually comes out and says that in the story, but we see that he has invisibility force field powers, and at one point I do believe he had stretching powers. So it's pretty heavily hinted that he is the grandson of Reed and Sue Richards. And I want to like this guy, he's a super genius, except that I don't. There is absolutely no substance to his character. At least with No Name, she was a plot device, but I feel like if she had been present in more of this story, she might have become more of a character, since she's basically gone throughout like three issues of this series, and the rest of these characters are going to rescue her. I feel like if she had been present, she would have been more of a character. But as is, this guy, I almost get the feeling that we are told that we are supposed to like him because he is related to the Fantastic Four, but other than that, he doesn't really have a whole lot going on with his personality. The other two characters, the ones who I do like, would be Gambit and Rogue Son. I think he's a very interesting character. Uh, in a way, he kind of reminds me of Cannonball from the 1980s New Mutant series. And again, if this series had gone on for 40 or 50 issues, I think that him and Becky Monroe probably would have become co-leaders of this team in the same way that Cannonball and Danny Moonstar did in the 1980s New Mutant series. He is very much the level-headed leader of the team. He doesn't want to be the leader of the team, but he is the one who is basically calling all the shots here. And I really like that character. I think he's probably the most well-rounded, flesh-out character in this entire book. And then the other one is uh, Kid Colossus. He's this kid wearing the do-rag here. And uh, he is uh, our Colossus, the Colossus that we all know and love, uh, his grandson, because Colossus, the one that we all know and love, his son was in X-Men The End, and then this kid is apparently that guy's son. And uh, he's basically just the big, dumb, loyal oaf, if you will. Uh, that sounds a little mean. Uh, in a lot of ways, he's very similar to the Colossus of the 616 universe. Uh, he's loyal to his friends. He will fight for whatever he believes in. Uh, he's not... He, he's not a very smart character, but again, I don't mean that in a mean way, but it does sound very mean, but he's not a very intelligent character. He's mostly there for his loyalty to his friends and his muscle. He's not really a very brainy character, and he's, you know, he's there. He's kind of like Colossus. Colossus is a character who I like him. If he existed in real life, I would want to eat lunch with him. I would want to hang out with him, but he's not a very interesting character. He's just kind of there. Um, so the characters in this book, ultimately not very well done. And I think, again, Chris Claremont usually has that problem where if you just look at, say, the first five issues of his run on Uncanny X-Men in 1975, you might say, this isn't very good. I can't see how this lasted for 16 years. Chris Claremont is the kind of guy who, when he first gets started, it takes him a little while to kind of dig his feet into a series and really start to do good stuff with the characters. It takes him a little while to get going, but once he does get going, then it's really good stuff. And so, if he just does a five-issue miniseries set in an alternate reality, then it's going to take him another five to ten issues to really make these characters sing and feel alive. And unfortunately, he doesn't have another five to ten issues in this miniseries. He just has a five-issue miniseries, and as such, the story doesn't ever really come alive at all. We never find out what's going on with the story. And also, the characters, only one or two of them really feel alive and three-dimensional to me. And the other characters kind of feel one-dimensional and very flat and one-note. And that's not really a good thing. So ultimately, do I recommend Gen X? 
No, unfortunately, I don't. It is leaps and bounds ahead of X-Men The End. It is much, much better than X-Men The End, but again, that's not really saying a whole lot. This is still not a very good story, but if you want to read something set in the future, if you want to read an alternate reality X-Men story, if you want to read something that is completely divorced from the Marvel 616 stuff, maybe you're like me and sometimes you just get sick and tired of the Marvel 616 stuff and you want to read an alternate reality story, Maybe you want to give Gen X a shot? I don't know. Uh, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's also got a lot of problems. And so, if you're very critical like I am, then you might read this and you might not enjoy it a whole lot. Maybe the miniseries that followed it up, Gen X United, maybe that is a little bit better. I am not going to buy Gen X United. I do not want to be that kind of person who I read something and then there's a sequel and just because it's a sequel to what I read, I feel obligated to go and buy it. If I didn't enjoy this 100%, then I am not going to make myself go and read the sequel. And since I don't have the sequel, I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to order the sequel just so that I can have it because it follows up on this story that I thought was okay. So that leaves the question, what kind of X-Men story am I going to be reviewing next week? I'm thinking that I want to do the first third of Grant Morrison's new X-Men series. I really want to get into some uh, long-running runs of the X-Men from the 2000s, and I have Grant Morrison's run on new X-Men in three volumes, so I'm going to be tackling that stuff uh, one-third at a time. So a week from today, you can probably expect me to be doing a volume of Grant Morrison's new X-Men. So I am looking forward to doing that with you guys, talking about that stuff, and I will see you guys later this week with some other kinds of videos. In the meantime, hope you guys have a great rest of the day. Catch you later.